those of you who know, who know me know that I, I like to start my talks with this um, video. And this video <clears throat> is the beginning of the story I'm going to tell you. And don't worry, it gets a lot better than the video. But the notion that I want to convey is that when you see this guy move versus these others, that ignites a system in your brain that's there pre-birth um, that is innate, evolutionarily conserved, and allows you to understand people as opposed to objects in the world. And so this was the beginning of my independent research career, and this line of work essentially trying to figure out how the brain processes people, and in particular biological motion, which is the type of motion that people produce, um, shorthand in neuroscience for, for that long idea of social perception, understanding other people's underlying intentions, started uh, this notion that human beings have this social brain and that's different from other parts of their brain and it's on equal status. So just as we have chapters about how we process math, how we do high level cognition, how we speak, how we reason, we now have chapters in you know, my, my favorite book, Principles of Neuroscience, dedicated to the social brain and understanding this, this work that's been going on. Um, and I was very fortunate to come in just as this work was beginning, and in particular to study the development of it. So I was um, quite um, happy. I had just moved to Carnegie Mellon, and um, the day, uh, one day I, I received tenure there um, for moving there from Duke University. And the next day, I got the word that my daughter might have autism. And this was a, a long journey. This was about four years of trying to figure out what's going on with Francis. And you have to understand that I was living in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, Durham, North Carolina. I had access to the very best healthcare on the planet and world-renowned experts in autism. It's not their fault that they didn't catch this. Um, you know, I didn't seek out the services as much as I should, in part because I assumed, well, Autism is mostly something that affects little boys, and Francis was extremely social, and autism is a social disorder, and I studied the social brain. So <coughs> Francis, and actually the day after the news about um, Francis, Ami Klin called me and said, I have an opening at the Child Study Center. And I'm not particularly religious, and Ami's not a carpenter, but I thought, <laughs> well, you know, okay, this must be some sort of indication that maybe I don't want to just study, um, and I had been told quite explicitly that I wasn't going to achieve you know, higher levels in my career at Carnegie Mellon by studying autism, so I had pretty much left it behind. And so I decided that day, and Ami said two things. One is that we have a job, and the other is that we'd be happy to see Francis. And so off we went to Yale, and this is actually a picture of Francis with, with Henry the Octopus, because that was her first word that she uttered was Henry. Um, and so. At Yale, I had the opportunity to build a research program in autism and a translational program designed to do experimental therapeutics with children with autism. And in particular, I wanted to understand why it took us so long to understand Francis's condition. And so, and I wanted to know everything I could about girls with autism. So we, we entered a competition to uh, receive an Autism Center of Excellence. I put together an incredible team, Matt State, Dan Gashwind, um, Jamie McPartland, Sarah Webb, some of the very best um, imaging scientists, electrophysiology scientists, and geneticists to essentially recruit what we think is the largest sample of girls to date. And I had the, the great opportunity to put this against the backdrop of the Simons Foundation's Simon Simplex collection so that we could use that infrastructure that was in place since we were a Simon Simplex site and many of these universities involved were also Simon Simplex sites so that we could recruit these girls and do deep phenotyping. And so this isn't trivial, just getting blood from all of these uh, girls and their siblings, and, and that's a very important part, which I'll talk about next, is, is challenging enough, but the most important part for us was getting images of their brain while they're awake and behaving and doing things in the magnet. And so that requires quite a bit of um, finesse, and we've gotten very good at scanning children with autism at this point. Any of you that have had an MRI um, know this is not the easiest experience. So making this friendly for a child is particularly hard. And I'm proud to say at this point that we're scanning children with profound um, uh, intellectual disability. So not just the high functioning <coughs> range, not just boys, but the full 
spectrum of autism. So this was one of the first studies that we did. This was supported by my NIHK award and the Simons Foundation. And we studied siblings because we were particularly interested in how siblings who share the genetic risk for autism, but nonetheless don't develop autism, what's different in their brains. And this is important because these red bits here represent brain regions that are different when looking at social information in children with autism. Now the problem with that, and Matt pointed this out earlier, is that that could just as well be the effects of having autism as it is any sign of the pathophysiology of autism. But if we're able to find an endophenotype, and this relates back to Matt's story again, the cholesterol, the endophenotype that allows you to unlock heart disease, brain phenotypes will be the endophenotypes that allow you to unlock the system's neuroscience of autism, which will then open up the genetics work and open up or wider the genetics work and open up in particular treatment work. And so when you look at siblings and see what they share in the brain, and these are the yellow bits here, what they share in the brain in terms of dysfunction with their affected siblings, you begin to get at an endophenotype, something that's inherited, something that shares the genetic risk, but isn't um, part and parcel of the disorder and certainly can't be caused by the disorder because the unaffected siblings have it too. That gives you an endophenotype. And um, finally, the, the thing that was most exciting to us is the brain regions that seem to reflect, here are these little green bits, that seem to reflect the um, compensation for having autism. Um, so how did these children who have the genetic risk for autism avoid developing it? We believe that these, these green areas, which happen to be some key areas involved in very high levels of social cognition, as opposed to simply understanding other people's nonverbal behavior, higher levels of social cognition are instantiated in these regions. And it seems as though the unaffected siblings are using more complex parts of their brain than unselected people, just people who without a sibling with autism. So they're doing it differently, even though they look the same as a typically developing child. And they seem to be doing it in a more effortful way. The most important thing, I think, is that the endophenotypes that we find are not specific to autism. So the brain findings are mirroring the genetic findings in that these are brain regions that have been implicated in a number of neurodevelopmental disorders, which links back to the point made about the developmental pathway and what's going to be essential. We lack, for example, in terms of a call to action, 10,000 uh, children, population-based samples scanned from early infancy to the first few years of life with functional imaging and electrophysiology. That would be extremely valuable in terms of unpacking what these types of findings in cross-sectional studies might actually mean. So a goal of all imaging research is to try to get a more personalized medicine approach where we can do diagnostic um, presentations. And so this is a study, I just want you to focus on this part here. Um, girls versus boys with autism, receiver operating um, curves. So when we first saw this, we realized we're way off the mark in terms of understanding girls and, and their brains, but we're spot on in terms of understanding boys. So we're able to use brain signatures in response to social information to understand and predict and diagnose, if you will, boys with autism. But we're worse than chance at understanding girls with autism. And this led us to follow it up in one of our first um, um, Autism Center of Excellence studies. And this is the work of Allison Jack, who's in the audience, a brilliant postdoctoral fellow. And what she's showing you is that mirroring the genetic results, this is a slide, part of a slide from, from Steve, Stephen Sanders, showing you that in the brain of girls with autism, they have a system that comes online more robustly than both typically developing girls and boys with autism that seems to be the brain reflection of an underlying genetic protective factor. And so this is something that's very important, both in terms of understanding girls and in terms of understanding potential for treatment, because you can try to fix something and, and quote unquote normalize it, or you can try to build alternative pathways. This might represent a pathway that's already there naturally in girls with autism that can be leveraged in terms of treatment, where their social brains are actually hyperactive relative to boys. Now, this is um, Pam Ventola, 
And we met because she's the person that ori originally did the ADI and ADOS with my daughter and uh, became a very important person in my daughter's life, but has become absolutely essential to our research program. And she's doing treatment research in which she uses behavioral interventions to try to alter brain targets in children with autism. And one of our first studies where she was doing pivotal response training with these kids, we realized very quickly that we had really two groups of subjects in our, in our study. We're targeting the social brain, and that worked really well. We were able to move around with treatment, the social brain, in boys with autism. But it just so happened we had another group that was already hyperactive in most parts of the brain, the girls with autism. And their actual movement in terms of treatment, what correlated with positive treatment response, is activation in low-level sensory areas and dampening down that activation. Personalized medicine, using neuroimaging to tell you at the onset which way you should tailor your behavioral treatment that has room for moving it around, that's already an empirically supported treatment, altering it so that it's different for boys and girls. Um, or for these different groups, because you know, this doesn't perfectly follow sex um, uh, differences. It's across the spectrum, but it just so happens that girls on average in this data were more hyperactive, boys more hypoactive. Useful information for t targeting individual treatments. Now, <coughs> I've talked about imaging of biological motion and social perception because that's what I understand and that's how I understand autism. But sometimes the tool you pick determines the answer you get. There are other ways to go after the brain and brain function. One is simply measure the brain at rest. And this, is a, uh, this data set that I had access to is a great example of where um, data sharing has really worked. It's resting state data from hundreds and hundreds. I think our final sample here was 1,500. Um, children with autism and typically developing controls. It's the Abide database and also thrown in here the INDAR database. We put all of these kids together. We used a high-level Bayesian framework to try to figure out the parts of the brain that were hypo and hyperactive in children with autism and how they're different in boys and girls. So this is a convoluted um, polar plot. Let me show you a little simpler way to understand it. Now I'm taking every imaging study via the Neurosynth database that's been published in a set of leading journals, and I'm saying, given the differences I see in the brains of boys and girls with autism, how do they line up? How are they interpreted when I compare them against all of the concepts of activation studies that are out there? And this is the deciphering. For girls with autism, the networks that are affected by their autism are emotion regulation networks, anxiety networks, attention, comprehension, meaning. For boys with autism, this is a surprise to me. Shouldn't be, most clinicians could tell you this, but this is the brain telling you this without any bias introduced by selection of clinical measures. Boys, no surprise here. Person perception, social perception, social meaning. For boys, this disorder severely affects their social brain. For girls, it also affects to some degree their social brain, but not as much. And this is really what's happening. And I think that maps on very well to the longitudinal study we saw earlier about the differences in outcomes for boys and girls. So I'll stop there, except to say, you know, this, this last slide I showed you maps on well to my experience now of Francis as a, as a tween going on age 25. So, you know, she's, she's moved from being interested in Henry. She's now interested in an American girl in Greece, and she uses Greece to help her sort of interpret this more complicated social wor world. Her favorite character is Frenchie. Um, and so, you know, and this is, and she's quite the fashion diva. And I'll stop there, but thank the people who have made this work possible. For example, the PRT work that I showed you earlier was funded by Autism Science Foundation. Um, it was uh, Pam Ventola's first grant. So. Uh, thank you.